Hi everyone, and uh, welcome back. I hope you've all enjoyed your lunch uh, uh, for the first day of not PyCon Australia, sorry, uh, Linux Conf AU. <laughs> <laughs> we were there too. Um, so. Uh, for the first session, we've got uh, Dr. Nikki Ringland, as well as Amanda Hogan, who is the president of the New South Wales Computing Teacher Professional Association, uh, ICTENSW. Um, and they're going to tell us how FOSS is child's play. So please make uh, Nikki and Amanda feel welcome. Okay, presenting is an important thing. Yes, yes, indeed. Ooh. Ooh. Oh no, auto advance. Quick, don't look, you're spoiling the things. All Sorry. of our jokes. It was meant to be from the beginning, it was. Like, <laughs> Just close your eyes for a second. Close yes. your eyes, yes, yes, yes. Excellent. excellent. Yes. Okay, so okay. <laughs> we're going to talk about how FOSS is child's play or uh, how we're teaching 300,000 students across Australia the skills that they need to actually become awesome FOSS developers and just generally competent human beings, or at least that's the idea. Um, so the, uh, this is a big task. So some of you might think back to what you studied at school, what you learnt in computing classes at school, um, and it was either maybe something on the left or something on the right. And this is mostly what's happening now. We've got this idea that we're, we're sort of either learning these general ICT capabilities like spreadsheets and maybe word processing and internet searches, I'm not sure, or maybe if in a, in a perfect world we could learn about some basic uh, data analysis, using some general purpose text-based programming scripts to solve problems that matter to them, like printing out a roll call in a sorted order. So this is the question. What is actually being taught in Australian schools right now? Is it on the left? Is it on the right? Or is it this? Unfortunately, more often than not, it's how to do word processing about these things, like staying safe online and not telling people uh, where you live, but not actually understanding the basics of security or, or anything like that. Or, or sometimes PowerPoint. It's sometimes true. Sometimes we do do PowerPoint. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of PowerPoint in schools. Um, I'm guessing that none of you are here today because you found those PowerPoint classes ridiculously exciting. Um, but, but maybe there, are, there do exist some people who do have that experience. We really want to make sure that students have a really positive, engaging, awesome, exciting, fantastic experience with computing classes at school so that they end up coming along to Linux Conf Australia uh, or PyCon or anything else and um, being part of our awesome community. So this is the state of classes, some computing classes, many computing classes currently. And this is the state of Australian computing education currently. So we have 31% of teachers teaching this stuff are out of field. So they haven't studied any computing themselves. They're often science teachers or maths teachers that have shown an interest and then become the computer teacher. Uh, the other thing we have is uh, a really low uh, enrollment of students into HSC computing classes. Uh, this is only based on software design and development because it's the only HSC New South Wales course that actually involves coding. The other two are kind of a bit more generalist. Uh, one's very connecting computer pieces together, uh, like printers and stuff, and one is uh, more systems analysis uh, and a bit of database. But this one is actually coding uh, and there's 2.4% of the students doing it, and of that, 7% are female. Uh, that's the 2016 HSC. That, that amounts to about 127 girls in all of New South Wales. That's a pretty dismal number. Now, Amanda was pretty generous there when, when she said, who's actually teaching those classes? I'm not sure about you, but my computing teacher was also my cricket coach, and that's uh, not an uncommon story. Okay, so... Uh, a couple of years ago, the government decided that actually the world was changing and we probably needed some STEM stuff. Uh, STEM is a great word, STEM. Um, and if you say, if you talk about computing to politicians, they tend to glaze over a little bit. But if you say STEM, they get all excited because it's one of those words. Um, so we went and we, we got the ideas boom and it was Innovation Nation. And we were going to have... <laughs> 
we have this, uh, and we can't mock them too much because the NISA is what's funding our project. Um, so There's never been a better time to have a federal government funded project. <laughs> There's never been, uh, but yes. Um, but it is, uh, this, this, was, this was the logo, this was the tagline for a while, but it got taken down, but I still love it. So uh, there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. So, so the idea is we've got this new curriculum. It's great. This came out of a shaping paper that was uh, written in 2010. Um, and this shaping paper basically outlines the, the shape of what's going to be in the curriculum, um, whether we're going to have um, coding or networking or security or databases or none of the above. Um, now, you may have noticed that we're no longer in 2010. Uh, it's now 2018, um, and this is... So the curriculum, our new national curriculum, is being rolled out across the states, and we'll come to that a little bit more later, but the issue is that schools tend to, curriculums tend to roll out quite slowly and be used for an extended period of time. So how can we design something, how can we design a curriculum that stays relevant for more than eight years, but maybe 18 years or 28 years or possibly longer? Uh, Side note, uh, in New South Wales, the ancient history curriculum has been updated more recently than the software design and <laughs> development that we saw earlier. Um, so, so we've got this, this issue that, that um, the curriculum is not going to get changed very frequently, but that's fine because technology doesn't change. It's not like uh, any new and exciting developments have happened in the last eight to ten years. No, 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 nothing, nothing has changed. So we need to really future-proof um, our curriculum. Okay, so we have a national curriculum, it's been developed, it's been shaped, it's been drafted, it's been agreed upon, it's been endorsed, uh, and so that's all systems go. We should just be all on track, right? Okay. National. It's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, first of all, there's that. Uh, New South Wales <laughs> is the only state that hasn't implemented. They're implementing next year. We are currently in a uh, plan for implementation phase, which is better than it was at this time last year, uh, but still not quite, uh, you know, ball rolling. Uh, but actually the shape of it is a bit more like this because these are the states and territories that have actually implemented the national curriculum as written. Um, Woo! Yeah, <laughs> yay! National! <laughs> Nation <laughs> national. Uh, so, uh, these are the states that have uh, made their own uh, version of the national curriculum and thankfully have implemented, but it does make things a little complex when you're trying to make national resources and you have to speak specific WA language. And then we have New South Wales, which is its own, uh, its own special uh, flavour again, but it hasn't yet been implemented, so that's why it's spotty. Uh, I like New South Wales. We'll get there. Yes, slowly, slowly. But nevertheless, the curriculum that we have in all of its various forms will require that every student, every single Australian student going to school will learn something more like this, something more like using computer science to solve problems that matter to them. And that's a really exciting present or future, depending on where you make a home. That's true. Um, however, we did talk about the 31% of te uh, computing teachers that were from out of field. And so this is what we call a wicked problem. We have a lot of students, our, our project documentation says 300, 400,000 students. Uh, we're meant to touch a million of them, like actually reach a million of them. But let's go with 400,000 because it makes me cry less. Um, so 400,000 students and we have teachers who have never done this before and don't really know what this whole digital technologies thing is. Uh, I don't really even know what digital technologies is, but the computer science thing is. And so this is what we call a wicked problem and uh, it means that it's not very well scoped and we're not really sure how to, how to come to a solution and we're probably going to need a whole lot of bits that fit together to form some kind of solution. And it's not the only problem. The, the other problem uh, that, that we like to draw our attention to is the amount of time that teachers actually have to address this curriculum. So this is uh, for a primary classroom, primary school classroom. Uh, this is the allotment of time. So English gets 25 to 35% of 
your weekly class schedule in the curriculum, maths gets about 20%. Science and technology there gets 6 to 10%. PDHPE, sport, HSIE, uh, history and geography, social studies, arts and other stuff um, as demonstrated. But really, uh, a few uh, previous discussions have talked about NAPLAN. Um, really, the focus on NAPLAN is very strong in primary school because that's how schools are evaluated. So NAPLAN really only looks at maths and English. So we can realistically assume that those 6 to 10% is really definitely 6, not 10. Definitely 6. OK, so then we've got science and technology together. Uh, well, yes, so that's now 6%. Uh, but that's covering both. So now we've got technology, which is 3%. And actually, in the technology subject, Digital technology is only half of that, and design technology, uh, sort of woodwork, cooking, sewing... Project is, management. Is the, and project, it's true. It's not just sewing. Um, although I still want pockets in more things. Um, <laughs> that's 1.5% of your time, which equates to roughly 25 minutes a week. Now, we're talking about a curriculum which is ambitious, which teaches uh, algorithms from kindergarten. And trying to do that in 25 minutes is pretty impossible. Uh, so the, the key is that we need to develop resources and, and get teachers confident in developing cross-curricular activities so that they can tick off some math, science, art, history, music, and digital technologies at the same time. So this is the actual curriculum. Don't worry, you don't need to read it. There are a lot of dot points. They're generally joined by the word and. Uh, there are things in there, but the... I just, the, the, there is a sequence mm. from K through to 10. So that's important. We have, act, that has actually been some thought put into how do we step through from, you know, baby steps of putting a story into order in sequencing in kindergarten to two, all the way up to really wacky, cool stuff in nine and 10. So if we look at that, if you look at the, the second row, since we're talking, we're talking about implementing a simple digital system. So introducing coding in a block-based coding language in years three and four. In five and six, we're also adding in decisions, um, if statements, if you will, in a block-based language. In seven and eight, we're talking about a general text-based programming language using loops, iter so iteration, making decisions. And then by nine and 10, we're talking about some really gnarly, cool computer stuff, modular programs and object-oriented object programming, things that are quite scary. Um, but it's a really good progression. Yeah. But the, the aim of this and how we keep the curriculum relevant is by focusing not on technologies, but on these key concepts. These key concepts of things like abstraction, uh, algorithms, data representation. And these are the things that have been true since the dawn of computer science, since the Enigma machine. And these skills that students are learning and practicing will be relevant even in a world with quantum computers or in a world where they're still making Excel macros. And to be frank, for most primary school teachers, because that's where the, the lion's share of this curriculum still lies, um, these terms are terrifying. Very. Uh, we've broken them down, so you don't have to read this slide, uh, but it is interesting that we've taken those uh, big concepts and we've broken them down into little tiny pieces that we think are uh, able to be understood and made a gloss we make a glossary for them and we can talk about these and then map the curriculum to them so that it seems more achievable. Well, Computing is all the way about breaking big problems down into little problems. Solving them one by one. So, Python. Yeah. Uh, so this is, this is an illustrative slide. Why did we decide to go with Python for seven and eight? Um, and it's mostly because of barrier to entry. We want Hello World to be as quick as five minutes in your class. Uh, and so... Because you've only got 25 minutes and 20 right. minutes is logging onto the computers. That's right. So we can't have HTML wrappers. We don't have time to explain why void has to go in front of a... Uh, Thing in C. So Python is really accessible that way. It's a good step from I've got these blocks that click together and they kind of do some stuff to, okay, this is a similar shape to the blocks because of the indentation and so that's why Python. And this is sort of some syntax that I've seen before in my previous experience with block-based, some block-based uh, resources, including the ones that we've released for free for year five students. <laughs> um, 
show students the Python code at the same time, so they're already familiar with the syntax as they're moving through uh, the, that progression. And the other thing is accessibility. It's open. We, we need to make sure that schools don't have to have any proprietary software to be able to run our stuff, and uh, we also want them to, uh, to, to it be accessible to all. So. So as easy as Hello World is over there, we, we can all agree that, that as far as Hello Worlds go, Python's Hello World is pretty good. But it's also still really hard. Really, really hard. Really hard. The, the graphs on the right here um, uh, indicate the success rate, let's call it, um, of a whole bunch of stats. So with another hat on, uh, I'm one of the founders of Grok Learning, and we teach programming and have been do doing so for, for many years. This is from about... Oh, several hundred thousand submissions to this question, um, looking at students and whether they can actually successfully solve the print hello world question. Um, if you'll notice that 54% woo, of submissions pass, but that means that 46% of submissions don't. They fail on hello world. And if you look at the second graph, this shows how many attempts students needed before they got a correct submission. So the majority of people got it right on the first go. Yes. Uh, many got it right on the second go, the third go, the fourth go. Uh, in this graph, you don't want a very high top score. The, higher, the top score in the second graph is 28. But that shows persistence, which is good, right? <laughs> it's really good. And remember, we're talking about Hello World here. So let's up the ante a bit and, and look at Hello Name. So this is a question that asks the student to ask the user their name and then prints out the world, words Hello and then the name that has been input. Um, this is tricky, right? We're using variables, which is actually a remarkably difficult concept to grasp. You'll notice that, unfortunately, our pie chart is a bit more Pac-Man style. And this is the one instance in LCA when we don't want Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Pac-Man is bad. Uh, less than a quarter of submissions for this question are correct. Um, you'll notice the second graph of how many attempts is required is much, there's a, there's a much bigger tail, a much longer tail. Our top score. <laughs> for record submissions, number of incorrect submissions in a row before they got the correct submission is 128. A student has attempted this question 128 times in a row, and that, I wish I could go and high five that student. <laughs> We need that student to stick with computer science because they are going to debug really well <laughs> once they get the hang of it. So, so we need to support both students and teachers because this is, discouragement is hard. This is, this is hard stuff that we're trying to teach and, and especially if you're not an expert teacher, if you don't have a technical background, it's particularly scary if, you're, if you don't feel like you're the expert. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit of a story uh, that illustrates what I'm worried about. Um, this is a story about Supergirl. Uh, there's a kid I know quite well who was, um, has been coding since she was about eight. You know, she did the Hello World about that age uh, in Python. Uh, and so this was a year or two ago, so about 11. Uh, she was tackling a really tricky file processing problem. Uh, had to open a file, had to scrape the strings and turn it into a dictionary and do some counting. Um, it, was a, it was a competition problem. Uh, and sh she just couldn't make it work uh, and burst into tears. I'm rubbish at this, I'm never going to get it, and I, want, I don't want to do this anymore. And, and that, like, heart. Uh, your, your heart, my heart broke a little bit um, because this is an extraordinary human being. Uh, I didn't learn to code when I was 11. Uh, I was not scraping uh, files for <laughs> dictionaries and counting, no. Um, this was not a thing that happened to me. So um, I wondered how this could be. Was it because, uh, well, first of all, was it a competition? You know, that's kind of external motivation and uh, it's not really real. I find in my own classes that sometimes if you get students to do something a bit more real, like uh, scraping a high score file, um, because it's related to the game they're trying to build, they really need to do it, so the motivation's there, so that gives them a bit more resilience. I wasn't really sure what it was. Um, and I really think that 
we need to make sure that w along with building skills, we build resilience uh, because we don't want kids that get this early start in life to hit some brick wall uh, and then give up and the teachers not to have the ability to, you know, concrete around them a bit and put them back on their feet. Uh, as it turned out, uh, good night's sleep and another hack at it uh, and she made it and the kid is still coding today woohoo um, <laughs> but it, it did it did really bring it to the fore for me what we have to do to kind of um, not baby but support these children as they learn these tricky skills and unfortunately at the moment we don't have an Amanda in every classroom <laughs> nor in every home um, we can work towards that maybe but but that resilience is, is tricky. But what we do have, what do we know? We've got a digital technologies curriculum, which is national. Ish. Ish. <laughs> Ish. And which every state has committed to implementing in some spotty form or another. But that's, that's a yay. This is a big step, right? We're not just teaching uh, word processing here. We're, we're teaching real things like the al algorithms, data representation, cool stuff. Um, and we also know that there are a lot of students in Australia, 4 million give or take. That's a big number. And we also know that there are a lot of teachers in Australia, uh, the majority of which uh, are moderately unprepared to teach this digital technologies curriculum. So about 300,000 teachers across Australia. Remember, every primary school teacher will be required to teach this curriculum. Every primary school teacher will know what the word algorithm means. They don't currently, but we're working on it and, and so are they. So that's what we do know, it's what we've got. Uh, this is what we've done so far at the Australian Computing Academy. Our mission is to help support teachers actually implementing this curriculum and support students who are learning it currently. So we have some resources that meet some of these needs. We're working on more. We're also in the process of doing a, a travelling workshop roadshow, um, basically hitting every state, territory, city, town that will take us, a whole running bunch of times. a whole bunch of times. A whole bunch of times. 300 workshops over the next two years um, in, in a town near you, ask <laughs> us how, um, and really supporting teachers in learning these concepts, these hard concepts, in ways that they feel properly supported and like they have someone that they can call up and ask for help when they get stuck. The other thing we have is lots and lots of ideas and enthusiasm, but we need scalable ways of actually reaching and supporting these, uh, these teachers and students and, and supporting the wide range of students because uh, at the same time as we have students who are really struggling with the concept of variables, we also have students who are struggling with uh, scraping files and dictionaries and, and hardcore data representation stuff and having a teacher who feels equipped to, to support both those students at once is really hard. It's really hard. Um, but nevertheless, we press on, we've got these workshops. That's our third co-presenter, uh, Bruce, who, who couldn't be with us today, but he's here in spirit. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Um, we've got these resources they're all online they're creative commons take them remix them check them out the platform that they're on uh, has free access to all of our resources for year fives and seven so if you know a primary school teacher or a high school teacher and teachers and teachers that's true they're all free for teachers any teacher who wants to learn computer science learn programming uh, send them our way so the official plan here we go the official plan is not just computer literacy. It's not just word processing. It's not just typing. It's the ability to create with technology, to design and analyze, manipulate, to solve problems that matter to students, um, which is good because we've got really big problems to solve. Uh, we need to do a better job at getting the message out to students that if they want to save the world, if they want to cure cancer, if they want to uh, fix global warming or unlock the secrets of the universe, a really good way to do that is through computer science and their interest. Um, we're not going to cure cancer just by stumbling across a new drug uh, somewhere uh, on a footpath. Um, we probably will need big data analytics and an understanding of medicine and computer science to do that. Um, so this is the official plan. We need to do better at explaining that to students. Um, the secret plan. Shh. Don't tell the teachers or students. Mm -hmm. The secret plan is that these really fun, positive experiences that students have in computing classrooms in schools will lead to a whole bunch more budding FOSS contributors. 
and really fun and awesome projects that I want to be a part of. Um, inevitably, it will probably also lead to more IRC bots and yet another JavaScript framework, <laughs> but I am okay with this. This is the secret plan. Um, so, the curriculum, right? This is, this is what we've got as the curriculum. I mentioned we've got a, a, a trajectory, and this is one of those curriculum outcomes. This is for year nine and 10, that students would implement modular programs, applying selected algorithms and data structures, including using an object-oriented programming language. This is a big jump, yeah. a massive jump. And these students are going to be really looking for something fun and exciting to sink their teeth into. There is a massive caveat here, though. This is in the year nine and 10 curriculum. But we can't expect the students who are currently going into year 9 or 10 to be at this level. This will take some time. This takes students going from kindergarten and getting that full progression and building up to this. But that's good because it gives you time to prepare. Yeah. We've got a to-do list for you <laughs> later on. <laughs> okay, so uh, a couple of years ago I was having dinner with some uh, friends of mine and one of them was a developer and said to me, Amanda, I, I don't understand why don't you just get your senior students to have a look at the Python code base? Because then they'd understand it. Then they'd be able to use it better. <laughs> and OK, that sounds funny, but I think the point that was being made was that if you understand that the print, state, uh, print function is something that's written, uh, that, there is, that you can actually rewrite it, that you can muck around with these things, that they are written down somewhere, it's not magic, that that becomes more accessible. But it is a little bit funny because when I get students in year 11, I'm teaching them what an if statement is. Um, and that's, the, the, that's the, the way it is right now. Um, now, that's okay because we have this massive plan. We have, the, we have the official plan, we have the secret plan. In a couple of years, maybe five, maybe a little bit earlier, let's hope, um, we're going to have some kids hitting that, uh, that year 11 stage uh, all over if statements, what the heck is this boring stuff, um, and want to do something really cool. And you still will have, uh, I'm a teacher, it's realistic that you'll still have uh, a, a mix of people in your classroom. You can't just say that since the curriculum has been implemented, that every child is going to achieve mastery of it. That's actually not how things work, but a proportion of them will. And so in, in a couple of years, hopefully, um, we could open up the Python code base and have a look at some of those functions that, that we use every day and see what's going on under the hood, because that does make you understand the code that you're writing a bit better than just having it be a magic black box. It's a pretty good thing to aim for. It is. I think five years might be a bit optimistic. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so, so this is what we've done. Um, this is the, the risking the demo god's wrath. We're going to do a bit of a live demo of what, the, what our resources actually look like so that you can all dutifully go back to your uh, kids' school, to the school down the road, to the teacher that you know, um, and see if we can um, actually tell them that this is a useful resource. Again, free for year fives and sevens. Yay. Thanks, federal government. Um, OK. Come on. No, it's not coming back. I'm going to reopen. Google Present broke my slides. Uh, you going? Um, <laughs> we can we can swap to mine. Yeah. Oh, look. There we go. Yeah. What have you got? USB I've got USB C, which was here. Sorry, folks. Oop. More dongles. Oh. Okay. There we go. It was hidden in the in the ether. I've got it. Um. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Windows. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, the, so the, the question was, uh, back when we were looking at the graphs of uh, submissions before correct submission, uh, whether students could test their code before submitting and whether those test runs would count towards that 20. No. No, they can test the code and those do not count before the yes. 20. So, um, sometimes they don't test the code. Frequently they don't <laughs> test the code. Um, but you'd think that they would before the 20th submission or 128th. <laughs> Yes. yes. Uh, they actually have to click twice to submit, yes. um, and you have to run it before submitting every change you make. Oh dear. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, which you will see very shortly. Yep. Okay, here we go. Um, embiggen oh. slightly. Uh, so this is our hello world question. It's moderately okay. traditional. This is the first question. Um, this is Vim enabled. Oh, Vim enabled. Excellent. <laughs> yes. I, I forgot it's logged in as me. Um, okay. So, um, so. She just did our, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. So, so we need to print out a program that displays the word hello world to the screen. Um, if we've read the notes, which, I mean, realistically, no student no. actually does, it would be really nice to think that they could go in here and run the code. And hey, look, there's the answer right there. No, 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 no. Okay, they're, they're going to start here. They're going to do something about print. Uh, and then gonna, they're going to say something like, uh, hello world, maybe. Maybe. And they'll try running that. Um, we, we think hmm. they're going to try running it. Uh, yes, well. That's where they could submit. Um, and we've got these nice handy things that pop up, is the idea, um, that demonstrate uh, and explain what on earth a syntax error actually is, because uh, realistically they've also skipped the slides on them as well. Um, and we've got uh, a, a couple of these, this hint box at the top. Um, Fine, you can turn Vim bindings well, you can't off. can't talk and type at You've the You've got same to restart time. the page. There. It. Um, so it, with a, a nice hint that says, are you trying to use print without the brackets? Um, uh, maybe Amanda can try putting brackets in, but stuffing up it. something else. OK. Uh, like the, OK, we'll try that. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. We have a successful run. Um, and now we can submit that to be marked, because we think it's kind of right. Um, ba -bow. Mm. Okay, so this is one of the incorrect submissions that would be ranked here. The question is asking us to print, a print the words hello world to the screen, but computers are uh, nothing if not pedantic, uh, and they have noticed, the computer has noticed that we did not print the correct punctuation. So it's guiding the student through saying, hey, pick up your punctuation. Oh. So the student does the minimum required uh, by the... <laughs> Uh, test, adds in the punctuation, runs it, says, yep, that's close enough, fine, mark it again, ba -bow. You got the punctuation this time. So if you'll notice that there are three ticks here. Here we go. We've got the words are right, yes, the white space is right, yes, the punctuation is now right, yes, but we don't use the correct capitalization and Computers only see difference, not similarity, so we have to be particularly pedantic at this point. Most students will just copy and paste the text from the question, and that is perfectly okay. Yeah. We want students to be long-term lazy, and if copy-paste is included in that long-term lazy, I'm okay with that. So now we're going to, to run it. Um, <coughs> yes, this actually still looks right. We'll print it out. Huzzah! Yes, and if this were the first time we'd answered a question or hello world, fireworks. we would get a little High fireworks five. and like, yeah, yeah. And, a, and a badge and all that sort of good stuff to really engage students, hopefully. Uh, you should see how dutifully they work through to get the green marks on the left side. of It's very cute. Yes. Um, so this is a very simple example, right? Hello world is, is quite a simple 
hopefully, <laughs> question. We want students to work to more complicated questions, but we still have these tests designed to guide students through to the right answer, testing edge cases, uh, testing their logic in the code uh, for all of the various different questions. So we're going to skip way to the end of the course, one of these courses that we've put together that does, in fact, teach students how to make a chatbot. Um, <laughs> because we definitely need more of these. So <laughs> a non-network chatbot. A not non-network chatbot in this case, I'm yes. I'm not doing sockets, no. Um, we'll, we'll work up to that. <laughs> it's in the seven and eight curriculum. Um, so so we're, we're going to do a live demo here as well. But, but we'll first take a quick squiz at the code. The idea here is that we're making a pirate chatbot that will mimic intelligent speech as, as much as a, both a pirate or a chatbot is capable. Um, <laughs> So, so we've got a pretty simple uh, code. We're reading in some input and using variables. We've already seen that that's pretty hard, 128 submissions hard, at least. Um, we've got a while loop that covers that iteration concept. We've got if statements within that while loop. But overall, this is relatively straightforward. There's, we're not doing something too scary. It's more all string thing. manipulation. It's all string manipulation. All right, so let's run this and actually see how it works. Um, okay, I'll pull this up. Arr, I am Captain Featherbutt. What be your name? Um, my name we went to town. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Nikki. Ahoy, Nikki. What be on your mind? Um, I am presenting. When I was last presenting, I stole a boat and sailed the seas. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> that be the real question, Nikki. I wish I knew. <laughs> so we've got a couple of special cased things, but it generally works as you would expect a chatbot to go. So we'll tell it to go away. Um, and it will will do that. All right. So this is this is fun. We get the kids to work up to this. We get them to build their own chatbots later, um, and it's a really fun and engaging sort of activity for them to do. That's the idea, at least. Okay. So so that's what the kids do. You've seen what we do. Now it's time for what you do. And if you would like to take that phone out and take a photo of this slide, this is the slide to do. But I've also already tweeted it, so it's okay. So first. You need to find out about computer science education in Australian schools. Tick! You've done that already! Well High done. five! High five! Okay. High five! High five. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Same. Sorry. Phew. Okay. Next, you need to talk to young people about how to solve big problems with computer science. Go to your schools. Talk to them about it. Talk to the kids. Talk to the teachers. Get them using these free resources. Please. Um, next. Oh, this is moderately... Yes. in the levels of easy to hard. I should give you that warning. Um, next, you should get involved with Google Code. And if you've got an open source uh, project that you're working on, get it involved. You should invent a time machine and watch Josh Simmons' talk, which was yesterday, or <laughs> go online and watch the recording, um, whichever is easier. Uh, you, all of our resources are released Creative Commons. Um, you should fork us. You should remix. You should uh, write your own chatbots. Um, you should get involved and mentor with the various awesome projects like the National Computer Science School, the Girls Programming Network, Fast Robotics, Zero Robotics, um, and a million others. Um, you could become a CSIRO STEM professional in schools. This is a fantastic, fantastic project uh, that helps teachers link up with ICT professionals or science and mathematicians um, and supports them either by coming in and co-presenting particular networking topics or uh, by just having someone the teacher can reach out to and uh, ask to read over their lesson plan. And they desperately need ICT professionals, please. Uh, watch David's talk, which was this morning, again, recording. Time machine or recording. Um, set up first time or only issues on, on your projects. It's really useful for, to see how students uh, can get involved and really actually invest in having newbie friendly documentation. And then once you've made it newbie friendly, send it to us and we'll show you how to make it more newbie friendly. Um, you could start a code club at a school near you. And finally, if you're working on hard, quit your job and become a teacher. It's really fun. Uh, okay, this is your to-do list. 
Uh, we've got our work cut out for us. Um, ask us questions. Yes, we have three minutes. <laughs> Uh, yes? Um, so the platform you are using there is Rawk or something? I can't say probably. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, are there other platforms that have been used in other countries around the world for learning programming? Uh, so the question is about uh, the Grok learning platform and whether there are other learning similar. platforms that are similar. Yeah. Um, there are sort of some that are similar, so Code Academy, um, things like that. Um, some stuff on Code.org. Code.org has Any fun. Uh, there are none that are, have widespread use across any particular country, to the best of my knowledge, which is why in 2013 I started this one. Yeah. Teachers kept asking me for help and stuff. Arjun. Um, Arjun. Yes. 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 Um, Uh, for Hello World, most of it's text semantics. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're really just talking people really struggling with the opening and closing brackets and strokes and. There's some of that too. Uh, that, yeah. That's why I'm uh, so, so for the failed submission, so the question mm. is, was. Um, Sorry. For. At what point does the code actually run? At what point does the code run? So for the marked uh, submissions that have been marked, if you have a syntax error and your code doesn't run, then it cannot be marked. Um, so so th that was all um, getting before. Um, we've run out of time, but I love questions, and we will be uh, around. We'll be around, yeah. Tweet me. Tweet us. Thank you.